Tonight, Google's plans for the living room, Samsung and Oculus collaborating, and redefining broadband in the U.S. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 98 for Friday, May 30th, 2014. I'm Jason Howell. We're going to get right into the tech feed now. Uh, GigaOM is reporting that Google's set to launch its new TV platform, that's Android TV, at its Google I.O. conference in June, citing anonymous sources. Internally known as Pano, the sources say Android TV won't be a device but a platform. TV manufacturers and set-top box makers can use this platform to bring streaming services to living rooms. Compared to Google TV, which focused on existing pay TV services and apps, Android TV will apparently start out with online media services and Android-based video games. The company is expected to announce some select hardware partners which could have devices running Android TV available in the coming months, as well as streaming partners like Netflix and Hulu. The idea behind Pano is that apps can surface individual pieces of content from the home screen displayed as cards so that users can browse movies, TV shows, and other types of media as soon as they turn on an Android TV. Google I.O. is set for June 25th and 26th in San Francisco, and I'll be there, so I'll tell you all about it. More details about Samsung's not-yet-announced virtual reality headsets are trickling in. Engadget reports that not only is it a VR interaction for Samsung's flagship phones, it's also a collaboration with Oculus VR, now owned by Facebook. Oculus is handling the software, Samsung's handling the, the hardware, and both parties win here. Oculus gives Samsung early access to its mobile software development kit and helps develop user interface software, and Samsung gives Oculus early access to its next-gen OLED screens. And Gadget cites sources that say Samsung's using an early form of Oculus Mobile SDK, an exclusive use as part of the deal. But there's a twist. Samsung's VR headset will use your phone directly. It plugs in using an existing port on your phone, becomes the screen. The headset itself has built-in sensors and accelerometer at the very least, so any motion tracking functionality is offloaded from your phone's processor. There are standard Android buttons on the device itself. It's home, back recent apps, as well as other buttons, functions of those buttons have yet to be revealed. In other Samsung news, the company is rolling out an update to Tizen 2.2.0, the company's in-house OS, to owners of the original Galaxy Gear smartwatch. Along with the update is improved performance and battery life, features such as an, a standalone music player, customizable shortcuts for tap input, and voice commands in the camera. The term high-speed internet currently has a definition by U.S. government law, 4 megabits per second or higher. But with the rise of streaming music and video requiring a lot more bandwidth, the Federal Communications Commission may raise the definition of broadband, which could in turn change the way it regulates internet providers. The FCC will solicit public comments on whether 10 megabits per second and up is sufficient to be called broadband or 25 megabits per second and up, according to an agency uh, officials speaking to the Washington Post. A higher broadband standard would likely increase the number of people in the United States that statistically lack broadband, which in 2012 amounted to 6% of the population. Now, the FCC can regulate internet providers if it believes that the rollout of internet infrastructure is being impeded. Under a higher standard for broadband, the commission could argue that an ISP isn't working fast enough to upgrade its networks and step in. Back on uh, May 13th, we told you that Europe's highest court ruled that its citizens could ask search engines to delete search results about themselves. Now, Europe's largest search engine, Google, has set up a way for people to make such requests. The company asks people to explain why a URL contains information that is irrelevant, outdated, or otherwise inappropriate. It also asks for a clear, readable copy of your valid driver's license, national ID card, or other photo ID to verify that impersonators aren't using the form. If a request seems valid, Google will remove the link from search results pages and post a notice that indicates the request was made like it does with copyright takedowns. But the company isn't pleased about it. Google CEO Larry Page told the Financial Times that he regretted having not gotten more involved in the public debate in Europe around the issue. And at this week's Code Conference, co-founder Sergey Brin said, I wish we could just forget the ruling. 
Now, coming up, WWDC is right around the corner, and we have pictures to prove it. But first, I'm joined by Adam Satriano, technology reporter at Bloomberg. Welcome, Adam. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's good to have you back here. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about Amazon a little bit. Amazon's war with publishers didn't get as much attention as deserved in a big news week. I mean, this is a huge news week this week, uh, but it's certainly a big issue. So let's start with the basics. Adam, in a nutshell, why is the company shutting out content uh, from publisher Hachette? Uh, this goes back to a, just a contract dispute between Amazon and the publisher Hachette. It kind of stems, the root of it stems back from when uh, uh, an antitrust suit actually involving Apple uh, it required uh, that put a lot of these publishers under the thumb of the government and now they have to go back and renegotiate some deals uh, with Amazon. And so now what you're seeing is uh, some of the, that these negotiations are being tough and Amazon is uh, holding, using its storefront as a way to kind of as leverage as, as to get better terms. And Hachette is trying to use uh, public relations and its authors a, as a way to hold its ground. And so uh, both sides have said now this week that it's going to be a protracted battle. And uh, it has a lot of consequences for how uh, books are, are sold on the Internet and who gets the, the, the lion's share of that revenue. Right. And I mean, it has consequences to the, the customers uh, as well that are looking. Why hasn't Amazon offered its customers an explanation for why they can't buy certain books? The, the explanation that they have offered is that these are part of business negotiations and that in the long run, this will be better for consumers. That's that's what they've said uh, basically thus far. Mm -hmm. Amazon compared itself uh, to bookstores in its forums earlier this week, saying essentially that brick and mortar stores have the ability to make visibility uh, difficult for certain books by keeping either you know small quantities in the back or not carrying them at all. Should we be holding Amazon to a higher standard here in comparison? Why, why would you think so or not? Uh, the argument for why uh, authors and stuff think they should is because that there's never been as uh, big of an entity here with so much clout in the industry. I mean, they are the biggest player here. And as people are increasingly reading more and more of stuff um, through electronic copies, Amazon's market power only grows since they are the, the biggest uh, player in that space. And so that is why they feel like they need to be held to a higher standard. Amazon would say that this is just a sort of electronic version of what has been going on in booksellers for a long, long time. Like you said, if, if, if there's a dispute between a Barnes and Noble and, and a publisher, Barnes and Noble could turn the screws a bit by saying, okay, we'll put you, your books are moving to the back instead of the display in the front. Mm -hmm. And that can have consequences as well. Right, right. Now, Walmart today said it's benefiting from the book publishing issue. I would imagine so. I imagine they're not alone. Uh, is Amazon so confident that it doesn't worry about losing these customers long term? Books have uh, increasingly become less and less uh, of a piece of, of Amazon's business. And, you know, someone I was talking to in the publishing industry was, uh, who's kind of a consultant, was making this point to me is that um, that's kind of disconcerting for these negotiations is that for the publishers, Amazon is like their most important client. Uh, but for Amazon, the book publishers are no longer their most in, uh, important uh, piece of material that they sell. And so um, this person is arguing that Amazon might have the leverage to sort of hold this out. I mean, people use their store for a lot more now than they did uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so Amazon uh, might, is betting here that they can wait them out. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of difficult to think of a category that Amazon doesn't carry. <laughs> so that right. makes a lot of sense. Uh, and Amazon has thin profit margins, and you know, obviously they're looking to boost income to appease those shareholders. Uh, is this the best option as far as that's concerned? Are there others? What do you think about that? I, I think it, uh, that's a, uh, an important piece to keep in mind as, as these negotiations go on is that Amazon – uh, almost since it, the beginning has either made no money and lost money or made very, very little. 
uh, in their stock valuation is is very high. And so investors lately have been really leaning on them to boost their, their profit margins. And this is one area in which they may be able to do that, but they've also increased the, the, the cost of the prime membership. Uh, and so there's different ways you're beginning to see that they are trying to uh, get out a little more income uh, out of their business. Awesome. Well, Adam Satriano, thank you so much for joining me uh, on Tech News tonight to talk about this. I think it's undeniable that this has been a crazy Tech News week, uh, but this story was super important. I think it just kind of got buried a little bit underneath Beats and Apple and all that other stuff. But thanks for uh, shedding more light on it with us today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Where can people follow your work online? Yeah, uh, go check us out at uh, Bloomberg.com slash technology or my Twitter is uh, at uh, Satriano. Uh, spelled S-A-T-A-R-I-A-N-O. Uh, so check it out on Twitter. Thanks again, Adam. Thank you. All right. And let's see here. WWDC kicks off on Monday morning at San Francisco's Moscone Center, but the company has already started hanging banners that hint at new developments for OS 10, 10.10 uh, 10 .10 and iOS 8. A photo of the iOS 8 banner shows the number 8 on what appears to be a watery background, which of course has all the Apple nerds wildly speculating about what it could possibly mean. It probably means submarines. iOS 8 will power submarines. I think that's the obvious choice. Our Twit coverage is going uh, to cover the event. We're, we're going to have uh, folks here covering the event starting at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time next Monday, right after Tech News Today. Uh, Apple will be live streaming the keynote. That starts at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. So join us, won't you? Uh, that's it for this episode of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash tn2. You can also write us at tn2 at twit.tv. And don't miss our morning tech news program. That's Tech News Today. That's uh, Monday through the week, Monday through Friday, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Jason Howell. Thank you so much for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.